And we're back. Welcome to No Direction, the Pathfinder News Reviews and Interviews podcast. I'm Ryan Costello. And I'm Jefferson J. Thacker, also known as Perrin. Although Paizo's been doing this Pathfinder thing for a long time now, it feels like lately a lot of things that are old are new again. Once upon a time, Rune Lords rose. Rune Lords are returning. And here to talk about the return of the Rune Lords is Adam Daigle. Hey, everybody. Hey, Adam, I forgot to mention your title. I'm sorry. Oh, that's fine. All right. It's Pathfinder Managing Developer, Adam Daigle. Ooh, super Hi, cool. everybody. <laughs> <laughs> so, Adam... This is a fairly new title, right? I know you've been in Adventure Path developing. Um... Oh. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Can we do a sound check? Okay. When I say make some, you say noise? Make some? Noise. Make okay. some? Noise. Okay. Thought I think he was, was just a... unstuck from time for a second. Okay. <clears throat> um, title. Uh, it was... No, it's been a little over a year now. What does it mean to be a managing developer? Um, basically, I am the manager of all the developers. Um, now, there's still books to be out, so I still... You know, I still develop products as well, um, but now I'm kind of working with Eric to kind of help, you know, get the schedule together, figure out what, what books we're going to do, and basically make sure that all the developers have the resources they need and, you know, make sure that not everyone's overloaded more than we're, more than you are in publishing anyway. Um, <laughs> but yeah, that's pretty much that. And given recently, Normally when I think of you and your responsibility at Paizo, I think of you as one of the two people that's developing the Adventure Path line. Is that the main part of your duty or is it just kind of like the most exciting and like forward facing part of it? Um, actually, I mean, I don't being in management now, I, d d I develop products a lot less than I used to. Um, like I last year, whenever I got this position, I was in the middle of finishing up Ruins of Aslant while trying to get into this new position at the same time and like being uh you know one thing is i'm in a lot more meetings than i was as a plain old developer um which takes time away from your desk from developing this stuff but yeah finishing ruins of aslan was super rough for me because i just didn't feel like i had enough time to do it all um because that you know that train was already rolling down the tracks before my position changed so all of that work still needed to get done but yeah and this isn't exactly, you know, an easy time to be the managing developer of Pathfinder, is it? Uh, we've got a lot of work to do. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and yeah. We've we've done a lot of work. Um, so yeah, no, it's 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 exciting, but it's busy. Okay, so I'm curious as to what you find more daunting: the dawning of whatever the heck is coming past August, without saying, or closing out all these products that for both for the end of the first edition product line i think they're both i think they each have their own challenges um one thing with finishing off the you know final first edition products is to make them you know really exciting awesome things that people want and not feel like oh well it's just kind of you know decreasing in quality or value as towards the end i want people to be really excited like uh we just um, announced that one of the last campaign setting books is Concordance of Rivals, which is something people had asked for for a long time after doing Book of the Damned and Chronicle of the Righteous. It's like, well, we got to do that third one, right? <laughs> and, um, you know, and it's got a lot of stuff that people are excited about, you know, like Proteans and um, Psychopomps and stuff like that. So it's, it's super fun to do. Um, and yeah, so closing out the last first edition stuff is super important. But I mean, we've been gearing up all the, you know, the, the play test wasn't just a play test for the game. It's a play test for our operations in a sense. It's like, you know, if we can stick all of that, then we know what our capacity is going forward for, you know, the, the final second edition product. If that makes sense. Yes. Why wouldn't okay. it make sense? I don't know. Where do you, th where do you think we lost you? <laughs> <laughs> I do have I'm a question just careful. on the uh, the concordance book. Would you say it was inevitable? Ha! <laughs> nice. I well done. <laughs> <laughs> but we're not here to talk about concordance books. We're here to talk about. Rune. I mean, we can actually not yeah. yet, but yeah, we will eventually. But, <laughs> but we're here to talk about rune lords. Okay, 
Yes. So we had Rise of the Rune Lords is one of the most well beloved adventure paths that's ever been written. Um, it's definitely the most supported single adventure in existence with products and mm. community out there. Like nothing else comes close. You've got 2D pawns, you've got miniatures, you've got. There's a freaking spell book wizard's tome version of it with pull out <laughs> handouts. And then then you guys did Shattered Star and the Rune Lords came back. And then you had the Year of the Risen Runes. And between all of that, I thought we had these Rune Lords pretty well handled. I mean, <laughs> just, just without getting the spoiler talk, returning might prove difficult for them. So so how, where does that how do we come into Return of the Rune Lords given where we left those Rune Lords many of which 6 feet under and or disintegrated Yeah well you know they didn't come back right you know they messed up <laughs> that's that's a, that's what not to do mm. um but yeah, I mean, like thinking that we were done with Rune Lords, uh, you do not know James Jacobs. I mean, this is his baby. Varicia is his baby. Mm -hmm. He's been weaving stories that have been kind of pointing towards some of these outcomes that are going to play out during this adventure path for a long time. Um, yeah, it's like I, th I think every corner of that he kind of has some sort of plot or plan for. Mm -hmm. um, and like you know like you were saying rise of the rune lords you know that was the first adventure path that i ever read completely it's the first one i ever ran um so being able to start this one off is is pretty exciting what are like what does rune lords mean to you or at least what does rise of the rune lords mean to you um <clears throat> it's well i mean it's it's the beginning of pathfinder for one or, or of pathfinder as a product not necessarily the game but the pathfinder adventure path um that was a time you know like when the magazines were going away and i had a subscription to dungeon and dragon and and it was just like so do you go along with what this you know this this piezo company is gonna try this brand new thing do i go along with it do i just like change my subscription over do i get my money back well what am i gonna do and then it was just like oh you can be a charter subscriber and i'm like all right, I'm going to roll that subscription over. I can always, you know, I think my subscription accounted for like the first four volumes would be mm -hmm. covered with the money I'd already paid. And so I was like, well, all right, we'll see what happens. And, you know, and then sure enough, I went ahead and did the whole charter subscription and stuck with it. I mean, I had a subscription to the Adventure Paths until I became an employee. So um, Rise of the Rune Lords is just the beginning of all that to me. And now you get to play in that sandbox. Right. I get to direct some of that sandbox. <laughs> Actually, you get to reintroduce that sandbox. You're writing part one. Yes. What are some of the pressures of writing the first part of a new adventure path, especially a sequel to the most famous adventure path? Well, I guess there, yeah, there, there's definitely pressures for that. I mean, like people, I mean, there are more sales for first for a volume one than a volume six. So it's going to get more eyes. There's going to be people, you know, you got to hook them in or else if they read it and, you know, don't like it or their whole party gets TPK'd, there's a chance they're not going to finish the rest of the adventure path. And so, yeah, I don't think at the time that I was working on it, I thought about that kind of pressure, but it's interesting that you bring that up now. It's like, oh, oh. <laughs> Start sweating. <laughs> I know. <laughs> now, I hate to, to do this because Rise of the Lords is, like I said, one of the most famous adventure paths, for, especially it's a shared experience for a lot of people in pathfinder but for any of our audience that hasn't experienced what the rune lords are can you give us a, a, a quick explanation of what the rune lords are and why they're important to the setting sure um in the way back machine ten thousand years ago a group of seven super powerful wizards each dedicated to a certain or to a s specific um school of magic ruled this part you know the part of Varicia. And I guess a little bit of the Norm Kings and a little bit. Of, anyway, ruled this part of the world and had their nations broken up into seven different nations. And they are also um, kind of corrupted the seven virtues into seven sins. That also correlates with each school of magic. It's kind of the quick and dirty of it. Mm -hmm. and where Evil did wizard. They go? Mm -hmm. uh, oh, yeah. And then this thing called Earthfall happened, and they kind of had a little bit of 
pre-warning a bit and so found different ways to put themselves into stasis, take themselves out of time, do all sorts of weird stuff so they could continue living. Um, and Rise of the Rune Lords is when Karzu, the first one, came back, or rather the first one to come back, did his thing. And if everything went well in your group, uh, he got smashed by a group of adventurers. <laughs> Now, it may be sacrilegious to say this, but it's Rise of the Rune Lords, but it's really only about one of them. Is Return yeah. of the Rune Lords going to be still focused on one of the seven, or are we getting multiple Rune Lords this time? In Return? In Return. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You're going to get multiple Rune Lords, for sure. How many? Uh, I don't know if I want to spoil all of that okay. yet. I'll say you run into at least four. Okay. Because I was doing some math. There's seven rune lords. We've seen one. There's six parts of an adventure path. Well, we've seen more than one. Yeah, you, you, yeah okay. Yeah, if you count Shadow Star a, and Risen Rune, yeah. You can't put a rune lord into the into a first through fifth level AP or adventure. <laughs> unless, I mean, what like, if the unless way something of like back horribly... Was... What that? if it was some kind of reincarnation gone wrong and they were like a child rune lord? Oh, okay, man, but that, that, that kind of that kind of cheapens the Rune Lord, though, right? Huh? <laughs> <laughs> All right. So tell us you're, you're doing part one. Tell us about part one. What where, where are the players when they're introduced to the AP? All right. Uh, this adventure path starts in Roderick's Cove. It's a little small, sleepy town. I want to say it's like 1,100 people. Um, it's on a river right next to the Brissian Gulf, kind of nestled in the pines, and. Um, the PCs start off in the little town circle, and commotion happens. Uh, things had happened in town, and the, the PCs, you know, if they're from town, they'll know. But there was, like, this brawl or something a couple of weeks ago that ended up with, like, five or six people dead. And people are kind of pointing fingers, and it's, you know, it's a small town, so it's super gossipy, and... but. Also insular where, you know, you may gossip about your neighbors, but if someone from outside of your community comes in and starts putting their nose around, you're not going to just like tell everyone everything just because of that. So there's some challenges. But anyway, so, sorry, the ghost of Sir Roderick, um, who kind of increases hauntings of the town when things are not going well, uh, the ghost of Sir Roderick pops up in the middle of this like, uh, something's almost about to come to blows and he pops up scares everyone off and the PCs realize oh you know they start learning from townsfolk that hey something's not right in town and people are getting kind of aggressive and what's going on with all of this to be fair it's his cove right and let's just give it back to him one of the things with the opener um is that the PCs are going to have to be self-starters. Um, there's not, you know, some old wizard that goes, oh, by the way, kids, you should go look on that house down on the hill or something. It's You don't have a, um, oh, my God. Um, yeah, there's not a, a super strong quest giver concept here. Um, so if you have players that have uh that try to push back against the story they might not be a great fit here you need to have people that are self-motivated and you know that are just like hey something's not right we need to go check this out now the original rune lord started really famously with the swallowtail festival being broken up by go uh, by goblins right and it not only introduced us to the world of galarian it introduced us to galarian goblins which you know set a whole other track of popularity into motion is that something that you are then trying to recreate with return or trying to completely avoid? Not necessarily. I don't think I, I there are a few like slight homages to um, burnt offerings in my adventure, but only in the sense of there's a little go outside of town and there's a chance you can run into a goblin tribe type thing. It's like super minor, um, but I wasn't going I think in my initial draft, I had a gang fight breaking out. That was the start. And the PCs could either pick a side or try to stop it. Um, and depending on how they did that, different townsfolk would approach them with problems that would then kind of lead them on the rest of the story. Um, but then James came up with the idea of like, hey, why don't we just throw Sir Roderick in right in the beginning and have him just like pop up in the middle of this? I'm like, OK, that's pretty good because. <laughs> 
it was also getting really complicated to have all the like if the PCs do this, then you could do that, and that you know like depending on the sides and trying to end it bloodlessly because the fight breaks out no one else has weapons but the pcs probably do and you don't want them <laughs> hacking into townsfolk for no good reason well it's a good reason but still yeah well, i mean there's there's fight and then there's fight you know like you can have a couple of people scuffling mm -hmm. but then you bring out long swords and it's like mm, okay this is a whole different level now <laughs> One thing I really like about that idea of bringing Roderick in right away is that I know virtually nothing about this new setting, this Roderick's Cove, except that it's named Roderick's Cove. And when you told me Sir Roderick was back, I immediately had this idea that he was an important figure in this town. He's a Sir. Like, with just a couple of words, you painted a vast picture. So that is right. really impressive. Yeah, Sir Roderick was the founder of Roderick's Cove. Uh, go figure, you know, named it after himself. Uh, but it was with a group of um, people leaving Magnamar to kind of like explore or, you know, start their own life somewhere else. And um, and yeah, he ended up getting killed by pirates out in the Verissian Gulf one day and has since uh, popped up and kind of haunted his town when things are not going well, which the last time was 10 years ago when there was some like civil unrest and ended up the port governor got ran out of town for being in cahoots with riddle port pirates. Okay. So you mentioned earlier that the PCs are going to need to be self starters. And then you also mentioned ghosts and uh, haunting. So what is the style of gameplay uh, here? Is this going to be an investigation? Is this going to be a spooky ghost story? Uh, what kind of styles of play do the players have to look forward to? Um, one thing, like, uh, for the most part, the um, entire adventure is pretty sandboxy. Um, that's kind of a little element of the have to be self-starters. But it starts off... Um, with a, a lot of investigation type stuff, mm -hmm. but kind of sprinkled throughout there, there's, as you talk to more characters, you get kind of pointed in different directions. There's different things that can happen in town that a GM can just kind of choose when to spring it on the players. Um, and there's some dungeony cause dungeony stuff. Cause Hey, you know, you've got to crawl down into a old Thessalonian ruin at some point. Right. <laughs> You I mean, also mentioned that there's an entire level of a dungeon that's just got cut. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, um, okay, you did warn people that there's going to be spoilers, right? Can, we, can I spoil? Should I not spoil? You should not spoil. Okay. Can you not spoil? I know. I know. It's like spoil is a weird term these days, especially, <laughs> like, in, in, especially in like nerd circles mm -hmm. because there's like sometimes someone will say that hey, this adventure has a dragon in it, is a spoiler. While some people, you could tell, you know, who the final boss is and the plot of the thing. And it's like, yeah, okay, that's not totally a spoiler. Like, I don't know where that line is sometimes. Like, there are, I'm sure there's some things I've already said that someone's at home going, oh, Daigle. <laughs> <laughs> Got to buy all the ghost-busting starter equipment now. Yeah, so you were asking Dungeon. And what else? What what? Was the rest well, of the specifically, question. you've already said that there's a dungeon that got cut. That's the kind of thing that legends oh, right. are yeah, yeah. made of. So, um, so, yeah, I guess it's not a spoiler that there's going to be Thessalonian ruins in a Rune Lord's adventure, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so that exists, and I had this bottom level to it that was this, um, and I can tell you all, all about this because it doesn't exist in the adventure. Um, but, yeah, I overwrote by, like, 7,000 words and... <laughs> This uh, in this section of this dungeon was like a little over five thousand, and I'm like, oh, well, that's most of my cutting that I have to do to this adventure, um, which made it super easy. Um, but also, I, I had to slightly modify the map, but it was low enough on the map that I could turn a full page map into a half page map, so it oh, wow. even saved money. Um, <laughs> or that saved more words, even instead of having to spend you know a full page. So that helped cut as well. Um, you just but anyway, did everything that the developing manager title encapsulates. It's like I saved money, I cut words, <laughs> and I wrote. I was creative, like everything about what you do at your job in one uh, sentence. Yeah, that's that's pretty good. Yeah, <laughs> no, uh, this was an old prison level um, where there had been a stalemate since Earthfall between the prisoners and the prison wardens or the guards that were stuck down there. And the guards were all like skeletons and skeletal champions and the prisoners were all zombies. And, you know, I think there was a 
Juju Zombie in there that was like the mastermind. Mm -hmm. And uh, basically they wanted out, but the guards were still doing their job. And so there was this like choke point where it was, you know, just a a lockdown where they couldn't, you know, and the PCs could, of course, kill all of the undead because you're going to. You're not going to side with, you know, intelligent undead. But you might want to for a few moments while you get the upper hand on things. Um, And then there was like, yeah, and there were some other like, more dungeony type critters around there, but it was all pretty self-contained. And I'm like, oh, okay, I can use this for anything. <laughs> I could, you know, s- drop it in some other adventure or whatever, because it didn't have anything really to do with the plot, aside from it had more hints at what was going on in this facility. Mm. You heard it first. The coming soon, a new PFS scenario. Adam Daigle's the Sir Roderick's prison. <laughs> <laughs> One of the interesting things about this being a sequel to Rise of the Rune Lords, the original Rune Lords, I, I can't call it Rune Lords anymore because now there's two APs that are Rune Lords. So <laughs> oh, the Rise of the Rune the Lords. The acronym oh. is the same. Yes, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Couldn't it be the Rune Lords are back, baby? <laughs> <laughs> all right, so in Rise of the Rune Lords, there wasn't even a Pathfinder role-playing game. It was all 3.5 Dungeons and Dragons, whatever was open, which was basically just the core rulebox. Now you've got almost the entirety of Pathfinder first edition at your disposal. So how does approaching this, I know you didn't write the original Rise of the Rune Lords, but how does approaching, uh, how does having all of these tools at your disposal change how you approach the adventure? Um, I would say the biggest benefit to me was having six bestiaries worth of things to pull from. Um, it really helped find the right monster for the job for each encounter. Um, it, that was probably the biggest benefit. I try not to make my NPCs too complicated where they draw from too many sources like, oh, okay, you got to have this feat, you got to have this you know, spell, and it's this class from this other book because no GM wants to have four books open while they're running an NPC. So that wasn't as much of a benefit, but I did get to play around with, you know, like haunts and dabble in some occult stuff because I, I like that flavor of thing. Um, but that's pretty much it. Monsters was the biggest boon. Paramount, did you have a question? I had a question and I've lost it. Go, go, go. Oh, <laughs> so you said monsters were the biggest boon. Any unusual critters we can have to look forward to? Um, that's I, not a spoiler. I got, I got to use a Grimple Gremlin. That was pretty fun. Oh, I named him Mr. Oh. Wretch. <laughs> And then also, speaking of which, you've done a fair bit of, of developing adventures and designing adventures and writing adventures. Um, and now that you've got to experience uh, Pathfinder through its lifetime, what do you think is harder? Mo- getting the monsters for low-level adventures or getting the monsters for the higher-level adventures and making them interesting? Um, what do you mean by getting? Well, like... Between which options of monsters to populate your your stuff? What do you think is the more fun? Which one's the more difficult? Oh, it's the higher level monsters are absolutely more difficult. Um, like writing and putting together APs, figuring out monsters for the last couple of books gets tricky because you've got to deal with one thing. A lot of high CR monsters tend to be large mm-hmm. or tend to be big and a lot of times you don't have space for them in wherever your encounter area is or you end up wasting a lot of map space on that one big critter when you actually need that map to show 10 different locations now you can only show four and you got to you know you've got to grind out that xp so yeah like and there's just not as many high cr monsters like we just don't you know that's just the way the game goes there's a lot more lower CR because a lot of the high CR tend to be single enemy. You know, you're not going to put like 10 of the same, you know, you're not going to put 10 huge CR 14 creatures together to make, you know, an appropriate encounter for 20th level characters or something. I (laughs) read. No, you don't. (laughs) What? You answer questions. (laughs) Well, you say that, but I distinctly remember the last half of, well, Rise of the Rune Lords consisting of, and then there are 2d6 storm giants in this group. Oh, right. (laughs) 
that's, that's where, what you have to do to make the encounter at that that's time. That's where it was difficult just fitting that stuff on the battle mat. It's just like, okay, I got all <laughs> my storm giants, and, and like I was lucky enough to have eight storm giants. And it was just insane. Just like the, every battle was just like a whole new battlefield, uh, enough miniatures to make my table waddle. Um, <laughs> I do like it when I get to finish one of the APs. Like right now, I'm we're running through... Um, uh, rain of winter and everything's at the super high level now and i do love it when it finally resets and then everybody's low level again and everybody's scared of every single blow it's it's it's, it's <laughs> wonderful that's an angry dog i don't know i think we should maybe go the other way <laughs> <laughs> well how angry is it <laughs> i just like the i have how many hit points right <laughs> single digit <laughs> Rune Lords and Thassalon is James Jacobs' baby, and he is developing this adventure path. So what's it been like working with James uh, now that you've developed adventure paths? So from the flip side of that coin. Um, working with him as a writer or as... As your developer. Oh. <clears throat> uh, James and I, we see eye to eye on a whole lot of things. And um, like as soon as he finished development, I went back and I was like, oh, I, don't, I want to read and see what he changed. And he changed very little and almost everything that he did change he came to me and he was like and that's one total benefit of us like our places our desks are you know 25 feet away from each other maybe is he can just come over and go hey so this character i was thinking about changing this to you know whatever so i'm not going to spoil um except for you get to meet a van kaskerkin in this one so um anyway that up because i'm not even sure what you're talking about <laughs> we can get to that in a little bit um no but just having james come over and tell me what he's thinking and to make sure he's like okay when you put this in here was it supposed to point to the, this other plot element and i can go oh no, no that, that was kind of pointing in this other direction you go oh okay so i mean it being able to ask me directly helps inform his development decisions and it's awesome to be there to have, you know, in case I had something I felt like being precious about, I could go, oh, no, 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 please save that, um, which it, I didn't have anything I was precious about. But Seems also, like there's a double, I mean, there's a, now as a writer, in having James, um, you know, as my developer, I blew my deadline on this. <gasps> which you're not supposed to do, says managing developer Adam Daigle. Um, and I totally used tools at my advantage of being a managing developer because I was like, oh, well, James is busy on this other thing. There's no way he's even going to be able to start development on that, which <laughs> once that wormed its way into my head, I used those tools to my advantage, which made me late because I was like, oh, I can put this off for a week. And yeah, bad me. I don't don't do the things I do. Telling people this. Hey, it's 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 very. I can. Ad, I'm admitting my faults, um, while still saying that it's a bad thing to do. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it looks like h half of the adventure paths were written by Paizo staff. So it sounds like this advantage that James had walking over to you. You could potentially walk over to Jason Keeley and say, "Hey, is there anything you need me to set up for part four here in part oh, one? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And that was that's. That's a super great thing with, you know, having so many in-house authors, you know, and it, being able to coordinate and stuff like that. And is this something? But mine is pretty standalone. Like mine doesn't, mine doesn't, mine is a, a kickoff. Mm -hmm. Like by the end of it, you go, oh man, these rune lords are returning. And then you move into the rest of the stuff. And, and I mean, James very well might weave more into the future volumes that I just wasn't aware of um, because that's what you do as an AP developer. You got to, you know, carry those threads forward. But m mine, I, I mean, you, I think a GM could take uh, secrets of Roderick's cove, pick it up, run you up to fifth level, and then, you know, just have a nice little short single module feel to it. And I think that would totally work without feeling like, oh, well, I'm not getting the full story. You know, you're going to want to keep moving on to the next one, though, because <clears throat> there's plenty of pointers towards grander adventure, of course. Mm -hmm. um, but it is kind of a low kickoff. It, it basically, in like James and I did a totally different outlining process on this one. We just kind of talked through a lot of it. You know, he was just like, okay, at the end of this, you need to know that X happens. The PCs need to know that X happens and they need to go to this town afterwards. And I was like, all right, I can set that up. 
And <laughs> so, which so is this... a pretty standard way of Let's go ahead, bro. So, do you even know what the rest of the adventure is like? I mean, if this was a kickoff and you didn't even need to tie into it, I know roughly what happens in the other five <laughs> books, um, or at least I know what was in the overall outline and little snippets I've heard from like Amanda and Jason and stuff like that. Um, but also, like, James could have changed so much in development that what the original outline said. You know the the broad outline of the whole adventure path. Some of that could have totally changed if James like thought of something cooler when he was around book four and went, "Oh, let's do this." And you know, who knows? Now, and I have not read them, so. <laughs> <laughs> now I had a question about. Um, so now we've seen Rise of the Rune Lords, and this one seem very simple, similar in the the slow reveal structure. Because uh, in Rise of the Rune Lords, you didn't really get to your Rune Lording until about book three or so, and then you figured out mm-hmm. that oh, all these clues were really tying into this big thing, and holy crap, that's what that star is. Um, and then you, and then you, the big bad is revealed, and you do it. But it's like literally halfway through the AP before you even know who Karzuk is, um, right? And then there's other adventure paths like uh, Reign of Winter or uh, Wrath of the Righteous where it's like within the first, well, Wrath of the Righteous, like within the opening crawl, that's the bad guy. You got to (laughs) go kill it in 20 levels. Uh, Which one of those do you find more fun to play in? Which sandbox do you like better? I I don't think the approach to the narrative is something I favor more than the other. I think it... Each way kind of uh, tell is a, just a different way to tell a story, and the story I think will dictate the best way to present it. Like one of the things with Rise of the Rune Lords is w- that we don't have to deal with in return is you've got to not only t- you know ex- talk about this big bad named Karzug that's coming back and is organizing all of these giants, and but you've got to explain to people what Thassalon is, what Earthfall was, how, you know, things have changed since. Like, you've got to tell the player, I mean, you know, the characters and the player, all of that stuff in a way. So if you just popped up and was just like, ooh, I'm bad wizard from 10,000 years ago, you wouldn't have that context, really. Um, now, with Return of the Rune Lords, you don't have to really do that because even in-world, people have known that this place called Thassalon used to be where Varicia is. And, you know, heck, 10 years ago, these people fought some guy in this mountain city called Zen Shalas that no one's heard of. But, hey, they've heard about it now, you know. Um, so, yeah, like, Thassalon isn't a secret anymore in Return of the Rune Lords. So you can go, oh, yeah, this is a Thassalonian rune. And someone's like, oh, really? Cool, we got our own Thassalon- Thassalonian ruin here. <laughs> Now this is a good you time. Give... Oh. No, no, go ahead. ahead. I was just going to make a dumb joke. Go. So this is a no, good whoa, time. Whoa, whoa. Dumb joke. <laughs> I was just talking about like using, you know, I'm sure that there's small towns in Borussia that use Thessalonian ruins as like their tourism board. It's like, oh, <laughs> hey, come see the ruin. <laughs> this is a great time to remind our audience that we record this live in a f- live Twitch audience at twitch.tv slash no direction. If you're joining us tonight, please get your questions in the chat. We'll be collecting them throughout the episode. So if you want to ask us or Adam anything about Pathfinder, developing adventures, Roderick's Code, why ghosts are great tourist attractions, get that in <laughs> right now. And we will be trying to get as many of those answered throughout the episode as possible. Thank you. Now, I was surprised to find out, Adam, you're not much of a game master. You're more of a player when you play the game. Yeah, I prefer to play, which I know seems super weird for, like, a game designer. Um, but <clears throat> I just enjoy I mean, one thing, I'm lazy, and GMing <laughs> takes a lot of work. Um, I know this. Um, I know myself. Um, but I, I, I like being part of the group. I don't necessarily feel the need to control the story um i just like being part of the people having fun and playing along with the story now i also tend to play like helper characters i like playing like clerics and bards and stuff like that i like helping people out and by 
playing that kind of character, you can also kind of help the GM. And, you know, if you know where this where the GM wants to bring this narrative, you can help nudge the rest of the party in that direction and be, you know, facilitate fun instead of, you know, be an obstructionist player or a super controlly GM. You're the kind of player I would pull off to the side and tell them you have ranks and knowledge plot convenience. <laughs> and I'd take it. <laughs> I also like that you said that uh, you don't you want to be a player because you don't want to control the story. You clearly have not GM'd often if you think that the GM controls everything. <laughs> okay, no, that's fair. That's fair. <laughs> <laughs> what kind of player would you play in Return of the Rune Lords? Sorry, what kind of character would you play? Um, I'd probably play a bard. All right. Mm, yeah. Would you lean into the Thessalonian stuff? Would you like? Yeah, like I think be- like a like a scholar type bard that's like you know really wanting to uncover lore. I think would be a lot of fun. <laughs> and of course, you know, being able to talk to a bunch of people and get them to, you know, do the things that you want them to do. <laughs> <laughs> now the bar- I need firsthand knowledge on all this sin. Who's going <laughs> to help me? Well, there's a in Return of the Rune Lords. There's a big aspect of like, since you're in a gossipy but tight-lipped small community, there are people who know parts of the investigation. But they're not, you know, you'd have to talk to a bunch of different people to, you know, to put the whole thing together and figure out what's going on. So you end up having to talk to a lot of different, some different people. Some are not so nice and some are super cool. Some are a little scared and you've got to coax the information out of them. Um, So that's another thing that would be fun being a very social type character in this adventure. So as a person who mostly plays, how does that flavor how you do development and design work? Uh, I think about the player a lot. Um, of course, you know, <clears throat> the structure and how things are presented, like the more like kind of nuts and bolts part of the adventure um, is built for the GM. And that's something I definitely play, pay attention to. You want to be able to present the story in a way that's easy for the GM to follow and run. Um but I think about the encounters themselves and I think about the players a lot. It's like, would you, if I were in this encounter, would I be having fun? Would I be overly frustrated? Would, do, is this reward something that I would feel is appropriate for beating this type of encounter? Um, yeah, I just, I, it makes me think about the player more and honestly players outnumber GMs. So if I could make four people have fun, that's more valuable than one person having fun. <laughs> Justin Sluter in chat, he doesn't have a question, but he's got an interesting comment that he played a bard in Rise of the Rune Lords and he might play that bard's son in return. And I guess 10 years of, or 11 years have passed since the Rise of the Rune Lords, right? So we could mm-hmm. actually be playing ancestors or people that are familiar with the exploits of the original characters that ran through it. Yeah, according, I mean, in official timeline, it is uh, 10, 10 or 11 years after the events of Rise of the Rune Lords. Now, depending on how long... You know, you might need to adjust that for your home campaigns Mm -hmm. because it could be like if Rise of the Rune Lords took them six years to finish, then, you know, that's going to. I don't, I don't know. It uh, You totally could be related to, and there's even an element, um, the player's guide is is out, and it talks about this a little bit. There's a element that James has worked through this adventure path talking about the Sahedrin heroes, and it's groups from previous adventures like Rise of the Rune Lords and Shattered Star have an opportunity to come up in Return of the Rune Lords mm. That's in, cool. an, in a fun and exciting way. And, and with it being oh, 10 or exciting. 11 years, uh, in, in Burnt Offerings, there is an opportunity that may have presented itself for some baby goblins to know to <laughs> potentially be eligible to be player characters of one day. And this is the exact age of an adult goblin. So if your group had huh. that encounter go that way, just saying. That's Did you just cool. know that? You just knew that goblins reach adulthood at 11? Yeah, uh, 7 to 10 years old. So they'd be a little bit more experienced. Well, they would be venerable <laughs> goblins. <laughs> it would be pretty good running it as a goblin. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> You can see we, we, we like the idea of goblins. Yes. <laughs> okay. Um, what's the back matter like? Um, this one's kind of unique. Um, the adventure... Excuse me. Um, 
the adventures are longer, so one of the things that we're doing for all of the Return of the Rune Lords is we cut the forward, and there's only two articles per, two six-page mm-hmm. articles, instead of the three that we'd been running for the last few years. Um, in this one, James put together a super helpful um double-sized article that talks about Thassalon, it talks about rune lords, it talks about sin magic, it lists previous rune lords, it lists this whole big timeline of Thassalon. Um, So, a GM running this adventure path has, like, us, you know, some of it's, you know, stuff we've collected from other articles and stuff like that, but it's all presented in a super helpful way that a GM reading it's like, well, all right, I've got all, I'm going to keep volume one handy throughout the rest of this AP because it's like a little tiny encyclopedia of Thassalon inside that article. And then, of course, some really rad monsters that, uh, like, done by, like, Jacob Michaels and Luis Loza and stuff like that. Mm. Oh, speaking of monsters, so, can you list one that isn't in the AP that is cool? That won't spoil? Uh, actually, I don't think I used any of them in the adventure. Um, but yeah, there's this, um, <laughs> there's a rad new fae that is, has some like music related things. Uh, I'm trying to think what was, what was Luis's? Anyway, I'm having bad memory right now. Luis, anyway, you're sorry. probably in chat. Tell us. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> Tell us about your monster. <laughs> We do have a question from Sluder. He's wondering if there's a list of people with Rune Lord ancestors. Ooh. Maybe like, not a list, but is there any talk about did the Rune Lords have ancestors? Could you play somebody that is at some point a descendant of a Rune Lord? With- I'm sure you could, but I don't know if we I don't know if we have a list of that anywhere, but there's at least one acknowledged in canon in one of Dave Gross's books. Hmm. There's a strong chance that a certain that if your group played through, I'm trying to think of a diplomatic way to say this, a <laughs> group played through Shattered Star, there is a chance that a they encountered a certain trap that had a certain magical effect that might people that some people might mistake you for a Rune Lord. That's that's as much as I'm because that's more of a Shattered Star spoiler, which we're at like. Five years away from, or five years from that is, where, what's the statute of limitation on spoilers? I say two APs usually. Okay, good. Uh, yeah, there's this um, trap in Shattered Star that you end up becoming. It kills a it kills a PC, and basically pulls them into a clone of Sh- Sorshin. So <laughs> oh, it's the PC, <laughs> but they look like Sorshin. And so there's even a campaign trait that speaks to that for Return of the Rune Lords in case that happened to a character of yours that you're bringing from Shattered Star into Return of the Rune Lords. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> Alina G asks, Return of the Rune Lords goes to level 20, doesn't it? Is that hard to fit everything in? Um, it does go to 20. Um, I'm not sure where in the last book you actually ping 20. Um, but <clears throat> mine... It, from Return of the Rune Lords, and it was tough. I mean, we had to basically cut an article. We had to get six extra pages of content for all of these adventures to even get us to that spot. Um, I think with my develop or with my turnover before development, I had calculated all the XP, and if you did every encounter, um, you would be like halfway through fifth level at the end um, of Roderick's Cove. Which I don't know if we've had an AP that's gone all the way that that far, but I had to get you know I had to get it at least breaking that five barrier, and I'm just like, well, there there's chances that people aren't going to finish every encounter, so let's go half again as much. So, wow, how many sessions do you think it would take to run through Secrets of Roderick's Cove? Ooh, um, since it is kind of like since it does have a lot of like role play and investigation bits, it makes it harder to figure out than just like straight combats. Um, man, I don't I don't know because different groups play at different rates and stuff like that. It, yeah, it's, <laughs> I mean like actual table time. Yeah, I don't know a while. <laughs> okay, because like if it takes two months and you're getting up to level five, like that's 
that's leveling every other session. So it's got to be like a three, four month commitment just for run. Uh, was my math wrong, Param? You made a face. Uh, it it. It is leveling every other uh, session, and that's a fairly rapid clip. Because you're supposed to level every 14 encounters, and that would, and your average table time is five encounters, so it should be once every three sessions in a normal Pathfinder average four hour a week play group. Sorry, I'm, I'm just curious. I'm yeah. killed the conversation. <laughs> <laughs> that's all right. <laughs> Well, I, I'm obviously no one's. Well, I, I shouldn't say obviously, but probably nobody's finished Secrets of Roderick's Cove yet. It is released, though, right? It came out at Gen Con. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, okay. no, it came out. It came out just this yeah. month. I got it last week in the mail. Or no, it was in. Okay. Sorry, yeah, it's an August mm -hmm. product, but then like it wasn't. It was like late August, and then mm -hmm. site issues and shipping and. Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, so that'll be interesting to hear how long it takes people to play this one. Because you were saying that it's standalone, it kind of could be its own adventure. So I wonder if it's going to be like, uh, it's going to double as a module and people will just play it as its own mini campaign. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's possible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, seen, from the boards, I've seen that. Um, I've only seen one person's like, yeah, we started our first session like this weekend or something like that. So I've been watching the boards like waiting for waiting for comments to pour in. <laughs> I'm also curious about uh, how many people are going to be starting it and know uh, early compared to normal. I know that it's become sort of a thing in the community to wait a little bit for like several, mm -hmm. several to drop. So, you, you know, the GM can know what's going on, prepare better and it's better supported. The tokens come out, you know, reasons you would want to wait right. to, to start it. But if, if there's groups trying to rush it in now uh, to get it in before two drops, Oh, to the second edition, you mean? Yeah. <laughs> uh, like well, at the same time, you yeah. are competing with uh, the playtest, effectively, for players' time. Yeah, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. So there's probably going to be... Don't don't feel bad if it feels like right. people are playing this adventure. <laughs> I know a lot of people are excited for Return of the Rune Lords. Mm -hmm. And I think for uh, Secrets of Roderick's Cove specifically... So feel good about yourself, yes. Adam. People will eventually play it. People will eventually, I'm sure, love it. Yeah, this is the I first. Mean, okay, this, that one I can't be sure about, but I hope. Yeah. yeah, this is the first AP I've written, which is weird. Like I've been, I've had the chance before, but it's always come up where I'm either busy with something else or I don't think I can hit that deadline. And so I've just said, you know, no a lot of times. And then James, when he, you know, said his whole idea is like oh yeah i want this ap to be return of the rune lords and blah blah blah. he's like do you want to write the first one and i was like okay first you know a part of the setting i know a lot of about low level adventure i love writing um and it's a kickoff for an ap i was just like that's i know is going to have a lot of eyes on it and so i was like yes i will take this assignment <laughs> <laughs> Hold on. Do you have, it doesn't seem like chat has too many questions. I think people are just enjoying the conversation. Do you have any final thoughts on Return of the Rune Lords before we move on to one of the other reasons we're having a, you on the show? Mm, nothing I can think of. Oh, Param? Are we having connection issues? We are. Hold a moment. Maybe. Yeah, yeah. Param is frozen, and from what I see on Twitch, uh, I don't think they're getting our signal right now. Are you getting hmm. my audio? Which means I can do the embarrassing face <laughs> sweat wipe. Oh. Yeah. This is where I'm going to add a marker. <laughs> a little bit. I, I'm pretty sure we missed at least something of what you said. Oh, I said this is where I'm going to add a you marker. Could. What a, <laughs> what oh, a timely use of a new feature. Oh goodness! Sorry, gang. It's still at red, and um, red means that it stopped uploading pictures to Twitch. I'm not really sure that why. I heard. Why? Okay, uh, we, we're recovering. I'm waiting for it to turn green. It's fighting. It doesn't want to. Mm. I'm at red again. Come on, you can do it, Twitch. You can do it. I'm very sorry about this, Adam.
<laughs> we no, it's, it's just really boring. Like no, the good fine. news is this is it all happens. in the in the recording. Best I'm getting all this question before as, we move on. Um, I'm getting all this recorded, um, but the Twitch people can't see it, and I'll have to edit it all out. And for some reason, we're going super high end. Oh, they can hear us, but no video. Okay, it looks like it's recovering. We're going green. And and we're good. We're back. We're back. Five Should seconds. We do a lag test. Yeah. When I say make some, you say noise. Make some noise. Make some noise. Okay. Okay. Five seconds of silence. And it looks like we are uh, recovered now. Uh, refresh the stream if you guys are still having trouble. And we can go back. Okay. Let's pick up with... Uh... Bastille. <clears throat> Bastille wants to know if you work with Sirenscape or other companies that support the adventure paths when you're developing your products. Um, that usually happens afterwards. Um, the last sound set that I had some involvement in was uh, the one for Sirenscape. And I basically, like, as soon as we had close to a final product... Uh, we would get Ben on there working on putting together the sound sets and um, you know, he'd it'd start off with him just like with a list of words and asking for correct pronunciations of, you know, cause weird fantasy names. Um, <laughs> and then, and then, yeah, he would send before, before it was done, he would send it over to me and see if I had any comments or anything like that. And that was kind of neat. That was the first and only time I've been part of the process. Who has final say on official pronunciation of weird fantasy names? <clears throat> um, I would probably say James as creative director. He probably gets final say, but you know, the in if you made a thing, the creator probably can you know tell you. <laughs> and when you're writing and you come up with a new name, do you practice saying it out loud to know? Yeah, what I, GM? yeah. <laughs> yeah, I don't want to. I don't want to make things hard on a GM. And also, you have to say it out loud because. Sometimes gamers are 12 year old boys and 12 year old boys like to make jokes that sound euphemistic. So if your weird fantasy name sounds anything close to that, that's a good time. That's a good excuse to change it to something that's not going to make the table start laughing. What I like about that comment is that you could be talking literally that they're 12 year old boys right. or you're just commenting on the maturity level of many of us at the game table. The effect is the same, right? <laughs> <laughs> I think the, uh, I think that that particular little bit of editing pass didn't happen with Rose Street Revenge. Just ah, saying. <laughs> I haven't. Oh. <clears throat> and then there's completely like legit real word, mm -hmm. real world words like a certain foil organization for the Pathfinder Society, the ASPIS <laughs> Consortium. Yeah. I was at a table where every time they mentioned the ASPIS, someone was like, anyway, he made yeah. a rude joke. The right. same rude joke every single time. He's just Aww. like, yes, we get it. <laughs> now, so oh, go ahead, Bear. No, this wasn't, no, this isn't the only book that you've been, not, I guess not a book, this isn't the only product recently released that you all have been, and specifically you, have been working on. Tell us how you're taking our maps to a new dimension. Oh, yeah, yeah, we recently uh, released the Dungeon Decor Pawn set that has um, furnishings for homes and dungeons, not just dungeons, uh, there's even some outside stuff, Um but yeah, that was a lot of fun, and that came on the heel, or that was, that product made it onto the product schedule because of Traps and Treasures, and people seemed to really enjoy that, um, just using a different type of, you know, people, we've gotten people using pawns and enjoying them there, so it's like, hey, what else can we do with these things? And that was, uh, I believe, either... If it wasn't the brainchild of Wes Snyder, it, he was the one that shepherded it through production. Um, and then when it came up, we were filling out the schedule, and it was just like trying to figure out which pawn sets we were going to do. And I was like, let's do another one of those. People seem to really like it. And then it became my responsibility. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, 
it's 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 a pretty fun set. There's a few pieces in there I'm particularly proud of. Um, one of them is a screen, and I made sure to do four of them. And so you can set you can like seriously like wall off a, a portion of a room visu- visually, just as if it had a folding screen there. <laughs> oh, awesome! So what I like about this is that there's been a lot of movement towards terrain based um, 3D models like. Uh, WizKids is doing it. Reaper really got into it when they started doing their bone stuff. And it's something that I admire from afar. But I know when I buy terrain, I don't paint it because it's not as fun as painting a monster or a PC. Right. And it's all, well, (laughs) that's how I feel, Bam. It's also uh, harder to organize. And so when I need that set piece, I have a harder time tracking it. So Pawns is the perfect venue or the perfect media for that type of thing where it's like I can keep it in a box. I know how to organize Pawns. And I can bust it out and like put it on the game table. So it's like, this is a significant thing. This is the thing when you're watching a cartoon, that one drawer that's a different color, it's got a pawn to represent (laughs) that this is slightly more important and it draws your attention. And there's some precedence for uh, pawn-like tiles. I mean, there was the whole, uh, during the third 3.5 edition, there was the whole dungeon tiles line that had like terrain tiles on this sort of stock. But when did you all, between you or Wes, or when did it happen when you all thought, but we could take this tile and put it on a base, and now it's standing? I don't know, but I mean, that was something that that I paid attention to when putting the set together, is like, which ones are going to be flat and which ones are going to be standing. But having that opportunity, I mean, you know, some things just work better one way or the other. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, legitimately, you could have a ladder both ways to show a top down of where the ladder is, or you could actually have a pawn showing where the ladder is or a stand up. Um, but it, I made sure I wanted to do a good mix of those of vertical or flat. Mm-hmm. Vertical is way more fun to look at. It just... mm-hmm. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, I mean, well, I... it's also, it's how we're used to looking at things that are more important than what's just flat on the map. Right. It's where the PCs and the monsters <laughs> go. One thing I discovered with these whenever I was uh, like I did a blog for the dungeon uh, decor pond collection a month or two ago or a few weeks. I don't know uh, whenever it was. Um, but that was a fun part of my job because I basically took a whole bunch of flip mats and then took a bunch of ponds and minis and put together little scenes on the conference room table and took pictures of it. Um, so, yeah, I got to play with toys as part of my job. Um, but. <laughs> But one of the things I realized whenever I was setting up some of those scenes is that they help you kind of reuse flip mats in a little way because, you know, flip mats have furnishings in the rooms and stuff like that. But if you want to make it look different, you can just use these like a a, a large bed is still a, you know, two inch by two inch square, just like it is on the flip mat. And so you can just cover it up and make it OK. Now this is a, you know, different bed or this what was just like a crate you can put a cabinet of curiosities on it or something else and kind of just change up the scene a little bit from some of those like pre-made flip mats and plus well, it's exactly how hollywood does it how many movies are filmed on the same sets in the same sound stages but you just change up the scenery you change up the sets and suddenly it's a whole new location or repainting animation like disney mm-hmm. has yep. done a bazillion times mm-hmm. And plus, uh, we're going to be talking with Stephen Ray McFarling about this on the next show, but you guys just released a set of dungeon tiles. Oh, those are so cool. Which which do not have furniture in most of them and would very much like to take advantage of your doors and tables and chairs and beds. Yep. I I was really glad when those were announced and they used the the accepted standard size for a dungeon tile that the rest of the community has agreed six inches by six <laughs> inches squared and it just makes it easier to set them up to and, and to put them all together if it's a uniform instead of like yeah and i love i love 2d 0.5d i think it's my favorite of the terrain formats hmm you want to just define what makes something 2d 2.5d 
Excuse me. Okay. 2.5D param? Oh, yeah. Okay. So I think we were planning on going into this during the banter segment a bit. But when you have a 2D map, that's just your standard battle map, whether you're using dry erase or a flip map or some tile based thing. And then you have the, on the opposite side, you have 3D. You have your Dwarven Forge. You have your Fat Dragon Games Dragon Tiles. You have uh, your Hearst Arts. You have your Warhammer sculpted out of styrofoam stuff where you actually make it look like the environment maybe you have the ceiling removed but the walls are there the doors are there all the furniture's in 3d but a, a surprisingly effective and more important much more playable option is those big walls also kind of get in the way sometimes uh, so you can have low walls or no walls and then but still have the furniture in the rooms to make it pop and that becomes 2.5d and it really enhances uh, like you can say that there's a you can draw a square and say there's a fountain in the room some players will pay attention to the fountain when you put a fountain miniature on the table players want to know what's up with that fountain <laughs> <laughs> one of the advantages of the pawns <laughs> is that it gets to reuse art and so cost i'd imagine it's one of the less expensive products that paizo puts out but i can't imagine any vertical furniture artwork that you had or uh, set pieces so is this how did you populate this product with the art yeah this had to, um <clears throat> yeah this had to use all new art and once we well, once i nailed down the list of what would be in this set i had to go through and do and write up an art order or do an art brief to get um the art team to reach out to our artists and get it all together so <clears throat> we did this you know probably did have a larger budget than some than some of our other pawn collections but and hopefully it'll all work out no <laughs> well looking over the list of it it's so much just universally useful pieces mm -hmm. that i have a feeling this like if there are further dungeon decor sets or like uh, set decoration sets people will still be going back to this one as like this is the core set and then anything else you put out will probably be a little bit more specific and like more situational right yeah and like <clears throat> man it was the the meeting that we had we got uh, the editorial team together and basically we're like all right we're gonna fill up this whiteboard with brainstorm ideas of what what kind of you know things can we put in this set and man, we like in probably less than an hour, we completely filled up that board. There was I forget I, I had a count at one point about how many things were suggested. And some stuff was like completely weirdly specific. And so it was like, <laughs> eh, that's not gonna work. But um <clears throat> I mean, I think in this dungeon decor set, I did end up putting a giant lily pad. Correct me if I'm wrong. How um, giant? Are we talking two by two? It'd be a two by two. I think I did. Lily yeah. pad, yep. Okay, there is so a that was one of wide lily pad in this. That stuff. was one of James's things. Is like, what about a really giant lily pad? And I was like, that's a silly idea, but I'm writing it on the board anyway. And then later, when I was putting it together, I was like, you know what? There, there can be a few silly ideas in here. <laughs> now we well, get... now we have somewhere for a frog hemoth to land. Exact. Well, a tiny frog hemoth, but <laughs> a tad Aren't hemoth. They... A tad. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> That's not an original idea. Cobalt Quarterly did a whole thing on the ah. stages of evolution of a frog hemoth. It's amazing. Nice. It's one of my favorite articles. <laughs> Man, I miss Cobalt Quarterly. Yeah, that was yeah. fun. So um, now that you've got this precedence and you've got two products in the line that seem to be very well received, um, any thought of in the Adventure Path pawns, either having terrain specific to them or working in some terrain pieces to the AP pawns, like if there's something that's, super important? That's a little trickier um, because, like, you'll notice that the die lines are different on mm -hmm. Traps and Treasures and Dungeon Decor than on the figure mm -hmm. um, pawns. Um, so you would have to do, you did either have to make. <clears throat> an entire new die that incorporated the two different shapes or each AP set, which only comes with eight sheets. One of those sheets would have to be completely terrain type pieces. Well, some of the 2d terrain could fit in the rounded die. If it's like a fountain piece or an altar. That's true. That's true. It's, I mean, it's, it's definitely not off the table. Mm. <laughs> I'm just trying to Is think. That a Is that a pawn joke? 
Oh no, his pawns it, are it, off the It town. wasn't, but it wasn't, but it is now. Yeah, I'm trying to think if there's any like famous terrain pieces. Uh, in, like, but you've already done. It, you've actually already done this. Uh, you you made Baba Yaga's hut, and that's technically a terrain piece. Oh right, <laughs> or the Crimson Throne. Right. We yeah. See, just looking over, there's a hundred or more than a hundred pawns to use. Yeah, no, this is a set I'm very excited about. Yeah. I haven't picked it up yet. I plan on getting it, and I look forward to when I finally get back to some around the table gaming to bust this out and change my game forever. Yeah, awesome. Yeah. This is one of the ones that I'm going to get multiple copies of. I already have the one copy, but when I saw what's in it, it's like I could use more than one of these. I need uh, six webs. I need twelve. Yeah, no, that's the thing is like it gets like putting one of these together because, you know, each sheet only holds a certain number of certain types. You've got, you know, the one inch squares, the two inch squares and then the the long ones. <clears throat> and so you've kind of got to like pick the pieces that would fit in the right shape and make sure you can fit enough of them on a certain die, but then not have too many of one thing. Because like, yeah, if it was up to me, I would have put totally put like 12 webs in there because web. <laughs> is not a small area of effect. <laughs> I think like a set of like spell effects would be a lot of fun. Ooh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. You totally. And like, even if you just have, and just like one of the, if just one of the sheets had some of the templates on it, um, that's actually, oh, one, that'd be rad. One thing that the, uh, the, the, I don't think many players knew that these were made officially, but if you were playing in the Dungeons and Dragons miniatures game, um, in the competitive, tournaments like this must be a tiny player base um but the every week you showed up to an official tournament they had the common templates there would always be one but they would specify it to a specific spell so it wasn't just a 15 foot cone it was collar spray it was oh, fireball it was web um and that was really cool um and they were printed on clear plastic, right? Yeah, so you yeah, can, they were like, printed hold on it clear over plastic. And... But obviously, the, I don't think you guys have clear pawn sets yet. That would be uh, <laughs> that would be amazing yet. Um, yeah, but I can see. I did this... note. I did note that he said yet. Here, here. <laughs> okay. So how much is laser cut acrylic again? Uh, but um, but I, I think that the this is a great idea. If if for no other reason than I just where I just said I would have to buy two. When I was buying dungeon tiles, I was I bought like it just became standard order my game store knew to hold them back it was like two of every small set and three of every big set because it's just like when i buy a pawn set one's enough because they're the specific monsters and bosses and then sometimes uh and then between the best three boxes that's great mm -hmm. but i'm always going to need more doors i'm always going to need <laughs> more webs <laughs> yep all right. Uh, is there any more questions from the audience? Oh, yes. There was one from Tom. Tom71. Uh, will we ever get an adventure set in Viperwall? Hmm. <clears throat> Possibly. All right. Uh, there's, there's nothing on the schedule uh, currently, but it's a cool... I mean, it's a cool area. And also, I mean, like, come on. You imagine seeing Viper Wall on the cover of an adventure. That's that's a that's good. Like it's got to be something of Viper Wall or Return to Viper Wall or something. You know, Scaling whatever. The Viper Wall. Okay, I, mm, maybe we'll put the, we'll put that on the back cover, the little back full headline above the synopsis. That All that right. might work there, but <laughs> no, it's it's also not off the table. But no current plans. On a similar note, uh, is there what area of Galarian do you think? Uh, that players might not know about that they should find out about? Like, what do you think is really cool that not a lot of people know about? Mm, that's tough. We have a lot of areas. Um, we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> oh, since you said Galarian, I'll say Arcadia. Oh. Wasn't, wasn't there plans a few years ago to really dive into Arcadia? I had been... I had the opportunity to get that book on the schedule if I wrote it. Um, I just, it never got beyond a folder on my computer with 8,000 words of notes. Jeez. <laughs> 8,000, there's got to be. Ish, maybe, I roundabout, something like that. I don't know. <laughs> but we so are going to, 
part of Tyrant's Grasp is going to have a little uh, gazetteer on a certain portion of Arcadia. Mm. So we'll get to peel back that a little bit, but that's Exciting. later. That's later, and that's a different interview. Yeah, this is not <laughs> fun. This is not fair. You guys are closing out the APs with this one-two punch with Rune Lords and then Tyrants. I mean, good grief. Yeah, I know, right? I mean, Rune Lords <laughs> popped up and was like, "Oh wow, that's a great one to go out." Tyrants? What? <laughs> well, you gotta, you know, you gotta. Um, there's a comedian, Mitch Hedberg, and he was talking about, he's like, in comedy, you got to start big and you got to end big. And then he said, you can't be all like pancakes, all exciting at first, but by the end, you're sick of them. So, you know, <laughs> you've got to end, you got to end big. I have eaten pancakes till I'm sick of them. I don't know if I've ever eaten pancakes and then been satisfied. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Well, thank you very much for joining us, Adam. This has been great. Is there anywhere people can find you online? Is there anything you want to shout out to? Um, I've got a fan page on Facebook. It's Adam Daigle Funmaker. And uh, on Twitter, I'm at Daigle. So. Excellent. Well, yep. we will see you hopefully in the near future. If yeah, absolutely. If not back on the show, then at some convention somewhere someday. Where we usually run into each other. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's been good sitting down and talking to you guys. And have a good rest of your show. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you. We will be right back to talk about 2.5D terrain uh, right after this. And we're back. So the last half of that interview, we really started geeking out on 2.5D terrain, or terrain in general, which I know is a passion of yours, Param, yes. and it has been a topic we've wanted to talk about for a while, but there's just been so many you know, timely things that we have to talk about first. So when Dungeon Decor was announced and released, we were like, all right, we, we finally got to have this conversation. Now, this is actually more of a passion of yours than mine, Param, but I always enjoy following your passions. Mm -hmm. So what is it about 2.5D terrain that just makes you so excited? Okay, so it's really where you get to have the best of both worlds. Um, when, you, when you're making a lot of terrain and you want it to look impressive, and so you do want to have like these really nice pre-drawn or textured or, or some format of, of, of base tile, which is why I like the dungeon tile products, which is why I like the flip map products and stuff. But that is very flat uh, by definition. Um, and sometimes it's really hard to to call out the, the specific feature pieces or get players to really pay attention to them more than just checking to see if they're stepping on um, difficult terrain or not, and, or more likely than not, not paying attention whether or not they're stepping on difficult terrain. <laughs> and when you do have uh, some 2D, 2.5D features or, um, and there's, an, there's another option to this that I also kind of like, which is called low wall terrain, which is similar where you have walls, but they're just really tiny walls that just go up a bump and uh, that just implies that there's a wall there and what that wall might look like uh, instead of just the tile going off into black space which is what like a traditional dungeon tile setup would go into um but it still has the same advantages as to it's mostly 2.5 d even there you're just implying there's a wall here uh with a little bump um and when you have the terrain on the table the players start to interact with it they start to go well, especially during encounters, it's like, well, I'm going to kick over that brazier. There's a brazier right here. I know it's there, and it looks kickable, so I'm going to kick it. I'm going to swing off that 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 torch. I'm going to pick up that pitchfork and toss it. I'm like, they start to actually really engage with the features of a room when it literally pops out at them in ways that they don't always do if it's just printed, or even worse, just. Uh, whatever scribble that you can manage really quickly on a battle map. And like, I've been really impressed with some people's battle map skills where it's just like, and this looks just like a bookshelf and this looks amazing. And you shaded the chair. Like, and then I'm, and then I've also been with GMs. It's like, this blob is the library. And, <clears throat> and then you just sort of go and, and with a good GM that you can, 
you can do either method well, but I do find that when you put a fountain, an actual fountain on the table, they pay attention to that. They want to know what's involved with that. And it becomes part of the encounters when you're running them in a way that a static drawing just wouldn't. Now, I made the comparison to cartoons where there would be one section of the background that's colored differently so you mm -hmm. can tell but this is actually a lot more like video games where you walk into a room and you kind of walk around until you see the the prompt thing show up mm -hmm. and then you're like that's an important piece of scenery that's an important piece of scenery and so you've got all this beautifully rendered terrain in a video game that is ignored because it doesn't have a prompt mm -hmm. so this is kind of the opposite of that this is actually the more ideal situation where you immediately can recognize which ones are the important things because visually they stand out and literally they literally stand out from the background yeah and this is a lot and and also it's also more affordable um two two dimensional dungeon tiles of various varieties are available cheaply in the world not so cheaply in the world um there you can make them fairly easily um there's some great youtube uh, channels that i'm going to recommend uh, right now that everybody check out and that's uh black magic craft um uh, DM Scotty and Wylock, uh, they have some great uh, YouTube channels on how to custom make terrain out of uh, really common and cheap materials, and it it's super easy if you follow some of their their uh, Black Magic Craft is the least easy because it involves purchasing a high dollar piece of equipment, but the others are literally using cardboard and tissue paper, and then what they put. Well, it also sounds like it involves Black Magic. Right, that's right, costly. But I mean, it depends on how much you value souls. But I value my own. Uh, there, here, or there. Um, but it's uh, but the, the others are like I said. It's literally cardboard uh, and tissue paper. And when they're done, these things look amazing. Uh, some of the stuff that uh, Black Magic does, and some of the stuff that Wylock does, would look like something you purchased from uh, uh, like. Dwarven Forge or uh, Hearst Arts piece. And then, of course, you can cast 2.5D Hearst Arts. I've seen some amazing stuff where they just focus on the ground tiles and the furniture and maybe like stalactites and such uh, using cast 3D resin pieces. So the floor tiles are 3D, but they're just tiles. And then they just put the doors on it and stuff. And that stuff looks fantastic. And I've also seen that stuff adapted for use in like Descent and Gloomhaven. In, in, in common fantasy board games too and it's this stuff is all, when you go full 3d when you start putting the walls on uh, it looks it looks great it looks fantastic it looks amazing and it's super expensive and storing that stuff is a beast i have i have a a large dwarven forge collection now that i do not use have not used it's like six hundred dollars worth of dwarven forge that just sits in storage because it is a chore to use it and like if i have enough time to set the stuff up in advance and and, it, and that stuff it looks it's you've been to gen con you've seen the dwarven forge and the tables and it's great but it's not something you can set up super quickly and there are other options there is like this 3d printed stuff uh, you can 3D print your tiles, and that is a fantastic solution if you have a 3D printer. It's slow. Printing 3D printing a, a wall segment takes four hours for one wall, um, and that's a lot of time. Uh, if you want to do a whole dungeon, it's like weeks. Uh, you can't keep up in real time, and then you still have to store it. But with at least that stuff, you can lock the rooms together, and so you just have like all your rooms pre-made sitting next to you and you can just go and there's the library and there's the dungeon and there's the barracks and that comes on the table real quick without having to do the uh the cover it up stuff but with the 2d stuff it stores in shoe boxes and you can just like click you just uh can quickly just like finger through it and like oh there's all my two by twos there's my two by threes there's my and then the furniture part is a little bit more difficult to store um because this it is it's basically like storing miniatures but if you store miniatures of any degree you just use the same techniques that i use for miniatures where i have and this is my thing for uh 
buildings and this is my thing for dungeon decor these is my doors this is my box of doors and just like i'm pulling out skeletons or orcs i also know okay i reach over there and i grab it and that's my thing that has all my light sources or there's my traps that's my box full of traps like literally here's my box of chairs I just realized that I should probably do a full disclosure that I am working with somebody on a 2.5 D project that's going to be going to Kickstarter very soon. <laughs> uh, I am working on it, not on any creative side. I'm just doing copy and whatever for the mm -hmm. Kickstarter and helping them with pricing. Mm -hmm. uh, and actually I will give him a shout out. If you go to Gregory Bose's Instagram, which uh, I queued up here, I believe it's jaded paladin. Is this something you should be talking about yet? I can well because he's publicly posted some stuff. So mm -hmm. if you want to check out some early renditions of what I'm talking about, you can go to Jaded Paladin on Instagram and you can check out a few of the things he's working on. Because uh, he's been showing me some of his things, and a lot of what you're talking about reminds me of Greg's project. Right, right. Well, to be fair to the audience, this was a, a section that mostly I've been pitching uh, an annoying Ryan with, so I didn't have any idea he was involved in. Uh, that was not part of the decision-making process of this video, uh, but we're both cool. busy people who are getting more and more involved in game stuff. So odds are, yeah. when we talk about something, if it's something we care about, then we might have some professional attachment to yeah, it. It's like any time we bring Alex on, he's probably written something of, related to what we're talking about. Exactly, and then the, and with our expanding show roster, that's becoming more and more complicated. It's like, is it related to Pathfinder in any way? Well, technically, we've got some conflict of interest. So you shouted out to a couple of different YouTube channels. DM Scotty and Black Magic Craft are easy and enough Wylock. to search. Wylock, can you spell that out for people? Uh, no, I think it's okay. W-Y-L-O-C-H. That's uh, what you put in chat? But mm -hmm. my source for that is you. Mm. Well, I'm going to... Uh, yeah, it's, it's, that is it. you're looking for Wildlock tiles. Uh, he, uh, this is really cool. He does the low walls on most of his stuff. Um, and he is like, when you watch his, his channel, it's like he knows the math super well. So it's like, and you cut this tile at 2.174 inches. And this one is at... And, and do listen to his math. He's got it down perfect. But he argues and he, all his systems and, and all this is optional. When you're crafting your own terrain, the great freedom is it gets to be your perfect terrain because you get to decide how it's being put together. And I, I tell you guys and girls out there, uh, this is really, really easy to do with some of these um, craft your own things. It's like literally grab a sponge full of paint, cut some cardboard into squares, speckle it speckle it in a different color, you're done. It takes 10 minutes to do a room uh, from scratch. From cardboard to finished room, hot glue gun, and sponge of paint, you can be done in 10 minutes. Um, and he argues for 1.25 inch squares instead of one inch square grids so that there's extra room for the miniatures and their equipment. He argues that we've been moving to 30 millimeter figures slowly over the year. And that's very true. Um, the 28 millimeter miniature is a myth. We haven't had 28 millimeters in a long time. Uh, if you see those very first early dungeons and dragons miniature packs, like the very first sets they did like Harbinger and you take their dwarf and then you put it next to a dwarf that has come out from a Paizo set recently. It looks like it's a dire dwarf. Like it's like, <laughs> like literally this is dwarf. This is new dwarf. Uh, I, I wish I could grab some and show you a uh, sort of thing, but also because he puts the low walls around his, his stuff, uh, it means that even if the worst case scenario, the tile is covered by a wall in the corner, so that there's a wall covering part of the tile at both ends, uh, then the miniature still has a full inch to sit on. Uh, and, and, and there's lots of arguments about whether or not you should have the walls outside the tile or sitting on the tile. And from my experience, if you're trying to replicate pre-drone dungeons where rooms can share walls, you need the wall on a square where it's taking up part of a square because otherwise it's very hard to exactly replicate what would be in a pre-published map 
if that's less of a bother, if you're mostly doing your own thing, then you can get away with having the wall sitting next to the tiles because then you're just designing in, in any of the deficiencies you'll design around. Um, and in any of these situations, it's actually very difficult to meticulously replicate any given map. So I recommend that any GM just accept some amount of variance because your players won't know it and they'll be mostly impressed that you have this 3D map. It doesn't matter if it's technically this room is one square shorter than it should have been in order to make room for that room. Now, where does dungeon decor come in, the pawn collection? Okay, so that's, you need, if you have the tiles, you need to fill them with something. If you did this, this, this really great job of, of making these, these great looking tiles, and you just put, you can't just, you, first, you can't even draw on them. I actually have seen some attempts to make them varnished so that you can dry erase on them, and that's kind of neat. Um, but you shouldn't, you can't, you shouldn't be using markers. So you do need actual furniture bits to stand in for the furniture in the rooms. And so the, the, the dungeon decor tiles are perfect for that, especially for like the rugs, because nothing brightens up a room and makes it look different than putting a rug down on it. Like you learn that real quick when you're doing a lot of these, um, and tables and doors and bookshelves, you need stuff that's standing up in 3d and the Dungeon Decor set that Paizo just released is great for that. Uh, there's lots of other options for that out there, both uh, make-it-yourself methods or like buying really cheap stuff that's available in the Deep Cuts line. They've started to put out a lot of furniture there. Um, uh, Reaper has tons of furniture you can get. It's super easy. And this is where the 3D printing method becomes super practical because um, printing... I need 400 walls and it's going to take four hours each. That's daunting, but I need two bookshelves and it's going to take four hours less daunting in, and being able to find the perfect piece you need and printing it, that perfect piece of furniture, that perfect idol, that perfect dark throne, and then just snapping that out like you do a miniature in a couple of hours. Uh, that's where, Things are really great. And again, um, Fat Dragon, of course, I've worked with them in the past professionally, so disclosure there. They do a lot of that. Uh, there's a group called Hobgoblins that does some of the most amazingly detailed furniture I've ever seen that you can get real cheap for their 3D printed files out there. And that stuff is real easy. And, it's, and tile and terrain is usually really easy to paint. It's usually just a base coat plus a dry brush and then an optional wash because wood is just spray paint black dry brush brown maybe wash stone spray paint black dry brush gray maybe dry brush lighter gray maybe wash um bookshelf much more difficult yeah that's when you're actually picking <laughs> out stuff but most terrain like chest chairs tables and stuff uh it's really easy to just paint that stuff up uh, because it's usually just one or two colors and if you're 3D printing, you can print in a base color. So I need dark brown. Grab dark brown to run through the printer. I almost forgot that I wanted to talk about Mantic Games' new terrain crate line, which I am oh. going to post a link to in the chat. This is something I say new, but it was announced, or at least it was posted on ICB2 in April. Mm. And it is ridiculously inexpensive yeah i so I the main their, the mega set is go ahead I, I saw their booth while i was at gen con this year and spent some time there and it looks great yeah the mega set is 80 dollars, and that is kind of like the 3d version of the dungeon uh the the, the puzzle product we've been talking about the dungeon decor mm -hmm. uh but more than 100 pieces and it's uh you know it's all uh, plastic or resin but then from there, the specific ones are $30, and then there's even mini sets that are $10, like Traps, Dragon Horde, and King Coffers. So anyone that has the link, I will try and remember to post it in the shell notes, mm -hmm. can check out the 24 images that go along with this article that show you just the quality and the, the vast, the depth 
of what they are offering through this set because it's impressive that they're managing to hit those price points mm -hmm. with this quality and this number yeah like i was really impressed with what i saw on it and uh i i it was only through great will saves that i didn't come home with like my arms loaded down with the stuff um but i was mainly at the point where i was I'm right now I, I was recently at the point where i was trying out a few of the different techniques to decide which one i want to go with full time with because I, I did make the decision that I have had that Dwarven Forge sitting in storage for more than two years now. And while I like to pull out the furniture, uh, I knew I wasn't going to be able to keep going in that direction. Uh, so uh, that's why I didn't bring a home a bunch of it, but I very much wanted to. And man, there's just, we're so spoiled with what happened is with 3d printers, a whole lot of people got really good at doing 3d modeling, which was not a common, uh, skill set to have. And now getting from idea to prototype to mold is so much faster, so much quicker to do than it used to be. Uh, like gone are the days when you needed, uh, Sandra Garrity just standing there with green stuff for eight hours uh, to make a one-off piece that then had to be cast and molded and stuff. You can get all this stuff designed very rapidly onto in, in the computer. It still takes hours and hours and hours, but then that can be infinitely replicated um, directly using 3D printing technology and then get and then that prototype can be made into a mold, can be mass produced. It's just the, the barrier to entry is so much lower than it's ever been before. And that is why we're seeing a huge explosion on the scene of options in very cheap options. Um, if you're willing to get a printer, which you can get for like $240 now, we'll get you an Ender 3, which will print you amazing quality miniatures. Um, if you just with a little bit of headache on the Z axis problem, but there's lots of community support there. Um, and then boom, you can just it, it print out hundreds of free, uh, terrain products you can buy files for great products you can design your own if you're willing to learn blender and make literally the perfect thing you need for any game and then with terrain crate and some of those options we're seeing from whiz kids and reaper it is easy and and really affordable to get some terrain on your table I do recommend people, if you are going the 3D terrain route and you are joining any file sharing sites, to make sure that you are using legal, legal to share files because mm -hmm. that has become a major issue with 3D printing. Yeah, man, I can't. I, I believe it and I just hate it because I know how little money there really is in this industry. Um, and I know how hard these people work to produce these files. There is free stuff out there that is literally marked as free. Um, like the, the, the open dungeon stuff is, is made specifically to be like an open source stuff. And there's lots of models out there that is free, but don't go downloading some companies, uh, uh, for sale product. If for no other reason than the, like, it's, it's cheap, man. Like $10 will get you so much terrain. You can print that. It's ridiculous. It's, it's, and it's, you get infinite amounts. It's the they're not charging a lot for these 3d files. So I really don't know why you'd bother pirating it. And then of course, risking all the risk you have when you're messing with sites that have that stuff to begin with. But again, I always, any say, other thoughts on 2.5 D 3d. Oh. Um, uh, the good news is the dungeon tile stuff has come back in, uh, the dungeon tile stuff has come back in print too. Uh, and then with Pazo's new tiles, so there's lots of ways to get your tiles on if you don't want to craft it yourself. So uh, I thought that was super important uh, to point out. Um, so yeah, there, there is very little reason to not look at this or consider it now. Man, you know, we often talk about how much stuff Paizo puts out that it's hard to keep up with even talking about things that we like. Mm -hmm. So I think people can just imagine how excited we are for this dungeon decor set. But this is the first pawn set we've talked about in forever. Oh, I know. Well, like all the other pawn sets are always like, well, you know, that art in the best jury is still good in the pawn set. And, you know, all that really mm -hmm. awesome stuff in that AP we talked about. Pawn set's awesome. Um, this there's very little original stuff happening in that space. They do do original art for the pawn sets because sometimes the the art that's in the books just would not make a pawn. 
Like, like the dragons are real bad for that because they draw this big, magnificent, like full page or half page art for some weird wing thing. And it's like, that's not going to fit in the square. So they do <laughs> do some original art pieces for the pawn sets, but the, most of it is stuff we've already seen before. Um, I mean, maybe we should do some more attention to that. Um, there's some things I've been considering that we may do uh, related to some of the stuff we're talking about today, but nothing to announce. And then I think we are about ready to wrap things up. We'll probably have an extended wrap up and shout outs just because there is a lot of network stuff going on that I do want to bring people's attention to and explain a little bit. Okay. All right. So we'll be right back to wrap things up right after this. And we're back. Thank you for joining us for episode 184 of No Direction, the Pathfinder News Reviews and Interviews podcast. And thank you to our guest, Adam Daigle, coming on talking about the Return of the Rune Lords and the Dungeon Decor pawn set and just adventure writing and developing in general. Adam's Adam's always a great guest. He's got his hand in so many different things and he's played so many different roles as a Pathfinder behind the scenes guy that uh, it's he's full of a wealth of knowledge and really we can go many different directions with the questions when we're talking to him. So it's exciting to have him on. Before we go, uh, I don't have anything to shout out to. Param, did you have anything saved up this week? Um, I wanted to, uh, again, shout out to those channels we mentioned before. Dion Scotty, Black Magic Craft, Wylock, uh, Hobgoblin Games, Fat Dragon Games. Places to go to uh, that, that are smaller on the scene. Um, I did want to do a shout out to um, uh, the uh, Roll for Combat podcast. They're sponsoring our oh, nice. Gen Con coverage. And I know they're in chat right now. So, hey, y'all. Uh, it's a, they're a great little actual play podcast. You should check them out. I don't know if you had to throw little in there. Well, I meant they're a great podcast. I don't mean little. Uh, but they're a great podcast. You should check them out. So just to bring people's attention to some things that are happening on the network, you may have noticed that we did not have an episode two weeks ago, which is very unusual for us. Mm -hmm. You may also notice that I don't have my backdrop up and that I am surrounded by quite the mess. So just to give people an idea of what's been going on, I moved recently. I finally sold my house. I know I've been talking about it for a long time, but that's because this was well planned out and we are extremely happy with our new house. Yay. But also my parents moved out of the Ooh. house that the, they'd been living in for over 30 years this same week, as well as my aunt and uncle. I helped them move. And so uh, just personal life wise, I have had all of my. playtest stuff i've just been running out of free time so you may have noticed that we had part one uh, i guess it was we recorded the part two of the playtest adventure on saturday mm -hmm. which ran long and so we weren't able to finish it and we are struggling to find time to schedule part two as well as or sorry yeah part two of the second part of the mm -hmm. adventure and then we we're also part three in there somewhere exactly plus more adventurous uh, plus, we've got Gen Con coverage coming out. So it's an unfortunate time for us to be so busy. So we do want to thank people for their patience. We are still getting regular blog content out, which is super impressive. Mm -hmm. And No Directions Back, we've got this episode here. We'll have another episode in a couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. At some point, Geek Together will be back. The idea of the last time it came back was not that it would then go on a hiatus immediately after. It was that whenever there's downtime on the network, I get to do some Geek Together stuff. Mm -hmm. And there has not been downtime on the network since slightly mm -hmm. before PaizoCon. So, uh, yes, you will have to apologize for the next couple of episodes. There may be a slowly sl getting more organized mess behind me. And maybe eventually I'll leave enough room for my backdrop again. And eventually I will even be in my new office, which is something I am looking forward to. It's going to be exciting. Mm -hmm. But until then, uh, there's going to be some last minute scheduling changes and things that you have to be aware of on the website. Oh, and actually, speaking of scheduling changes, we didn't make a big hoopla about this, but we are now starting our content at nine o'clock because mm -hmm. Paizo has started uh, Starfinder Wednesdays at eight o'clock, eight o'clock Eastern, rather. And so we wanted to give them the half hour for their show and then a half hour grace period so that we could do the changeover because we don't want to split that audience. We recognize that people are coming here because they're passionate about Paizo stuff. And so if Paizo has something on at the same time as us, odds are they're going to get the audience. Mm -hmm. And so um, we've been making adjustments, but we are constantly still putting out new material. The fact that we are putting out slightly less podcast material 
this particular moment is just a reflection of our personal lives being extremely busy, mm-hmm. not any kind of lack of commitment to the podcast itself. Right, right. Yeah, and it's just a whole lot at once uh, in just scheduling. And uh, we did, in the post Gen Con haze, we did need a break and to handle all that personal stuff. So that's why we did take the, a break from both podcasts, uh, Beyond and uh, No Direction. Um, there may or may not be a Beyond next week that has nothing to do with this. It just mainly has to do with whether or not we can get, um, uh, it's whether or not we can get uh, a, somebody to cover for me and run the podcast trained up in time for that episode because I'll be out of town that day. Um, but uh, it's not on any sort of permanent hiatus it's just it it is having more unfortunate scheduling than no direction had you could say param that you wear a lot of hats yes and that joke might make sense soon (laughs) (laughs) Uh, yeah and there's other stuff that is a patreon related joke so i guess we should bring the people's attention to we do still have the patreon Mm -hmm. and i do feel bad that we launched the patreon and then we got bogged down with all of this stuff but Mm -hmm. It's actually not like we're putting out less content than usual. We are still putting out more content than usual. Right. It's just we haven't been able to keep up with that increased pace yeah. this particular month. And the specific flavor of content may have changed, but we are putting out, on average, more content every week than we've ever put out. With still more to come. Oh, gosh, yeah. I think there's still like 10 more Gen Con seminars. Oh, yeah? yeah. All right. Well... Whenever you get to them, Param, people understand. <laughs> I also shout out to Hoskins, uh, Vanessa Hoskins, for helping me edit those. Uh, Vanessa is amazing in editing. Oh, my God. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Super fast, super thorough, super good. Like, nice. Faster than I am, by far. She might have a new job. <laughs> we love you, Vanessa. Thank you so much for joining the network. <laughs> I mentioned our Patreon. Do you want to tell people where they can find out more about it? Uh, yes, you can go to patreon.com slash no direction or more easily just go to no direction podcast.com where you find the rest of our content and click on the Patreon link. And while you're there, make sure you click on the discord link where you can join us in the most chill, awesome Pathfinder chat room going or Starfinder chat room. We cater to both as well as just random other nerdity. Uh, it's a great way to reach out to us or any of the other members of the staff. Also, while you're there, you can leave us questions. Email us at nodirection at hotmail.com for any questions you have there. Make sure you visit our Facebook page at facebook.com slash nodirection. Um, make sure you visit our YouTube page at, no, at youtube.com slash nodirectionshow. And then there's twitter.com slash nodirection. And all of these things take place and are linked to from our nodirectionpodcast.com website. Until next time, I'm Ryan Costello. And I'm Jefferson J. Thacker, also known as Param. And if you want to find the path, you need no direction.